Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, um, Transforming School Meals, How School Meals for All Can Drive Food Systems Change. Uh, while we wait for more folks to hop on, it almost goes without saying that for any policy discussion, we can easily talk for more than the 45 minutes that we have today. So it's our goal um, that, that today's webinar will be just an informational, an inform informative overview um, you know, sharing why this is not only important to us, but to many, many others throughout the country. And we'll also be sure to share plenty of resources so that you can explore this uh, content in more depth. And today I am grateful and excited to be joined by Sarah Martinelli with Arizona State University and um, whom I'll introduce uh, in full later on, but my name is Ryan Betts, and I am a policy specialist with the National Farm to School Network. Um, I'm based in Mississippi, which is the lands of the Choctaw and Quapaw peoples, and I coordinate our Who's at the Table School Meals campaign. And so for today's agenda, um, you know, I'm going to quickly overview Farm to School and our National Farm to School Network touch on our Who's at the Table campaign, then I'm going to pass it on to Sarah to talk a little bit more about school meals funding and policy, and sure. then she'll kick it back to me where I'll kind of make these connections with values alignment and school meals for all policy, and then we'll hopefully have some times for questions and answers at the end. Um, just as some housekeeping, housekeeping, we are recording today's webinar, um, and we'll be sure to share it and the slides following the presentation with all registrants. And as questions arise for you, please enter them into the, the Q&A feature. Um, we'll have our team working uh, behind the scenes to answer any questions in real time. And of course, like I said, we'll have time at the end to, to talk through them. Um, and I also believe that you can vote for, for questions. So if, if one resonates or stands out to you, please feel free to vote that up and we'll, that'll help us ensure that we get to the most popular questions here today. And additionally, if you if you happen to have any technical difficulties, um, just enter that in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll try to do our best to support you all. So when we say farm to school, we're talking about activities that support the connection that communities have with fresh, healthy food and local food producers and ways to engage children in learning about food and agriculture. So there's no one defined program, but collectively farm to school activities empower children and their families to make informed food choices while strengthening the local economy and contributing to vital communities. And so all these elements combine to make success in farm to school. And these same elements uh, uh, extend to the range of early care and education settings. You know, at a critical time of development for, for young minds and bodies, um, farm to ECE provides improved health environments and experiential learning that um, shapes children's health and wellness experience uh, and family and community engagement. So farm to school uniquely sits at this intersection of numerous sectors where kids win, farmers win, and communities win. And, you know, these cross-sectoral benefits include public health, education, economic development, the environment, and more. And this triple win is what we'll be exploring more as farm to school and values connect with school meals for all policies. Um, but I do want to highlight farm to school's impact on economic development. Um, so farm to school policy and programming strengthen connections within a state's food economy, and that provides for an increase in economic activity uh, in local communities and in states. And we see an increase in the number of vendor and producer relationships, as well as the diversity of methods of procurement used by schools. And this in turn increases social capital, which generates positive relationships for farmers with school districts, families, and community members. And this really contributes to the transformation of school lunch. Um, farm to school and local procurement means that cafeteria professionals can, um, can showcase the in intentional innovative ways that, uh, that improves school meal quality. And these are actual school lunches from California, which is a state that's passed school meals for all and integrates farm to school and values aligned policies. So at the National Farm to School Network, we have a vision of a strong and just food system for all. And we seek that deep transformation towards this through farm to school and ECE settings. And as a leader in the National Farm to School movement, we advocate for policy system and environmental change. We facilitate networking and movement building opportunities, and we offer professional development and resources for stakeholders and community food 
settings. And as a network, we're made up as, of, uh, of a wonderful advisory board, a small but mighty national staff, as well as hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of partners and tens of thousands of network members. Um, and we'll be sharing more on how you can become a partner with us as well, which is open to anyone and it is free of charge. So our core functions as a network, we're a hub for information, connecting people to resources. We're a hub for networking, connecting people to people. And we're a hub for advocacy, connecting people to policy. And grounded in our work is our call to action and our community values. So we care about the livelihoods of farmers and farm workers because the people who grow, harvest, process, and prepare our food shouldn't have to struggle to put food on their own tables. And we care about the conditions in which animals are kept and how food is grown because these processes directly impact our climate environment and the labors within that industry. And we care about how food is transported from the farm as well as the people who load and drive the trucks and its effects on the environment. And access to fresh, healthy foods helps empower our students with the knowledge and skills of how their food gets to them via programs like Scratch Cooking and School Gardens um, to build healthy habits later on in life that will increase control of their and their own food system. And school food professionals like the school food directors, nutrition experts, cafeteria managers, and the other folks who serve food to kids you know, they see on a daily basis what kids choose to eat and what gets chosen for them. So to create a good experience and provide all students with tasty, nourishing food, you know, we must invest in the salaries, equipment, training, and operational support that cafeteria workers need. Um, and, you know, for NFSN as a movement, you know, we deeply care about racial equity as the central reference point on values alignment and action. So we must value and build right relationships among everyone in farm to school. Um, in ways that ensures 100% of communities will hold power in a racially just food system. So across the country, we need a system of school meals that serves all children and values the people who get it to the table. And farm to school is a key strategy in this effort. Um, and that's why in 2022, we launched the Who's at the Table School Meals campaign to support advocacy for values aligned universal meals. And you know, this is a new way of thinking about the entire system that feeds kids in schools. Um, because school school meals really need to be seen as part of a bigger system that not only feeds kids, but ensures that everyone ensures that everyone along the farm to school journey um, benefits. So since the federal government ended the pandemic era school meal waivers, which provided free school meals, there have been a number of different federal bills that have proposed to address school meals for all. But progress on the federal level has been slow. We can't expect any immediate action. So states have really been taking the lead to reinstitute school meals for all. And in many states, a broad base of folks um, have come together in coalition to develop, introduce, and pass universal meals and incremental policy. Then, you know, we've just seen headline after headline after headline of uh, a wave of new state universal meals policies. So as of June 2024, a total of 36 states plus DC have introduced policies and or have formed coalitions. And of those eight have actually passed permanent policies. And there's many more states introducing and passing bills that make incremental steps towards school meals expansion, such as eliminating, eliminating the reduced price copay or providing free breakfast, for example. And we see these as steps in the right direction. And multiple polls at the national and state levels demonstrate the incredible popularity of free school meals. And as I mentioned before, this, in, this issue is bringing many people together. And this is a growing force that just simply cannot be um, ignored, um, especially in light of recent findings from the from uh, on household food security that was just recent a report that was recently released by the USDA Economic Research Service. You know, many households um, experience intermittent food insecurity throughout the year, but in our conventional school meal uh, model, the school meal paperwork is collected once at the beginning of the school year. So this model, as opposed to like a school meals for all model, you know, the conventional model, uh, you know, misses out on the chance to help families cope with the changing ways to make as they make ends meet and to minimize uh, the impact of these hardships on kids, even temporarily. Um, and I really love, this is um, from Ryan Parker, who's a school board member in Maine. And Maine is one of those states that has passed a uh, permanent policy. And this said, 
this has had um, major financial um, implications for their for their overall general education school board budget. So he shares that the school budget in my community would habitually include eighty thousand dollars that we plan to transfer to the dining service programs, and that's how much debt that they'd be in at the end of every year. But because of universal meals in May, because of their school meals for all policy, their school food program is now operating in the black. And this year, they don't plan to to um, budget any money for dining services because they're operating in the black. And that is the real the realized benefit of universal meals that is spread across um, his state and Maine. Um, so how did we get here? Um, at this time, I'm going to invite Sarah to uh, to come and present. And I'm going to spotlight her real quick. Um, Yes, there she is, um, and provide some background on the context of school meal funding and federal state policy. But first, I just want to ask um, a real quick poll, and I'm going to get this set up here, if I can get my screen to cooperate. Yeah, just a real quick poll. Um, how familiar are you with the National School Lunch Program and the specific policies of your state regarding school meals? Um, and Feel free, are you very familiar? Are you somewhat familiar, not very familiar at all, um, or not familiar at all? Just would love to like kind of see where everyone's kind of coming at. Um, Sarah, like I said, Sarah's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but I'll give you all maybe about 10 more seconds um, and seeing kind of a range of answers from, from most folks who are somewhat familiar, um, very familiar. Um, Elizabeth, I see that you've raised your hand. If you want to go ahead and put your question in the Q&A or the chat, um, we can probably get someone to help you out. But awesome. So I, a majority of y'all are very familiar to somewhat familiar, but we do have some folks that are not familiar, not familiar at all. But um, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Thank you all for, for taking the time to do that. And Sarah, I'm going to pass it on to you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. So can you move forward just a slide or two for me? Great, thank you. So just a really brief primer here on school meals. Of course, the National School Lunch Program is a federally assisted meal program that operates um, in about 95% of all schools across the United States uh, with the goal of providing um, a reducing food insecurity and supporting nutrition. If you wanna to move to the next slide, Ryan. So I think one important factor we need to understand and when we're trying to discuss how um, school food authorities or school food programs get their funding is to understand that most school food programs are what we call self-funded programs, which just means they don't typically get funding directly from the district that they work within. Instead, their funding um, is reliant on student participation in meals and the resultant um, federal reimbursement from those meals. So students eat meals in the cafeteria, the cafeteria collects counts of those meals, it reports them back um, to their state agency, and then they get reimbursed um, at a later date for those meals. Now, depending on where the, uh, the students land um, in our qualifying criteria, they might also pay a little bit of a copay to the school. So the two primary funding sources um, from schools or for school meals are federal reimbursement and family copays. Now, um, sometimes or often <laughs> those two combined may not uh, provide enough financial support uh, to keep school meals um, viable in a school cafeteria. And so uh, some schools do also choose to support the, that income with all cart sales. So a la carte is gonna be uh, snacks that are added on um, to a school meal. Uh, those do have to meet federal nutrition guidelines uh, uh, called smart snacks, but they're often not quite as nutritious as the meals that are served. But again, um, often these are seen as sort of a, a necessary addition in order to boost up some of the overall um, funding that they might get uh, in a school cafeteria. So generally speaking, school food, authorities or school food departments are relying on federal reimbursement for meals served, um, which comes directly from student participation. Can you go on to the next slide for me, Ryan? Thank you. So we are going to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of this traditional school meal funding system. So Ryan alluded to this earlier. This is the right now the current system that um, a good majority of schools are relying on. Uh, so this funding mechanism is referred to as the three tiered system. And the three-tiered system um, 
basically places students into one of three categories based on their family income as a percentage of the federal poverty line. So again, families are required to submit applications at the beginning of the school year. School food authorities have to print, distribute, collect, and process those applications. Um, and then based on a family's income, they'll classify students as either free, reduced, or paid. What this chart is showing is the eligibility criteria. Again, that's um, percent of the federal poverty line. And then we, we provided some examples of what that actually looks like in real income for a family of four. So in this example, um, in order for a family uh, or a student of a, in a family of four to qualify for free meals, they would have to be making just about $40,000 a year. And in that scenario, the student wouldn't pay a copay and the school would be reimbursed um, by the USDA a uh, total of $4.43. As we move down into the reduced price category, we see the income um, goes up ever so slightly. And so a family making at just over $57,000, um, or just under that, sorry, just under $57,000 would qualify for reduced price meals. And in that scenario, $0.40 cents, uh, is paid by the family to the school, and the $4.03 comes from federal reimbursement. And then finally, in the paid category, um, students are paying the full price for meals. That, that um, paid meal price is not set by the federal government, and it does vary a little bit from school to school and district to district. But on average, that meal cost is about $3. And again, schools are then getting reimbursed um, about $0.42 cents for those meals. So the struggle with this system, of course, uh, is that it leaves out many students who need support. I think most of us can acknowledge that a family making just a family of four making just over $57,000 likely still needs support uh, from the school food system. And so these income uh, requirements, um, although they do adjust slightly every year, right now they're pretty out of tune with the cost of living um, expectations. And of course, the biggest issue I think with the three tiered system is that it promotes um, a feeling of stigma in schools so that um, school meals become sort of associated with, um, you know, maybe not having enough money or being the quote unquote poor kid. And so that not only adds additional stress for students, but it also prevents lots of students from actually participating in meals, even if they happen to qualify. So somewhere around 20% of students who do meet these income qualifications uh, may not participate due to stigma. And then, of course, um, finally, this system does set schools up to have to potentially collect debt from students who eat in the line um, but don't have the money to pay for the meals. Um, and student meal debt is probably the worst part of any lunch, um, any lunch cafeteria staff's job. They don't want to have to collect debt from students, but unfortunately, this system sort of sets that up um, into the system. Can we go on to the next slide, Ryan? Okay, so the three-tiered system is the sort of primary way that schools get um, funding from the federal government. But we also have um, the Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP. And in this system, instead of, um, we, are, we do have some improvements um, with CEP in the sense that students are not expected and families are not expected to submit individual applications. In this system, instead, uh, schools or districts um, can apply to be um, or can can qualify for CEP uh, and they in this system then all students eat for free without individual applications. Uh, so the way that it works though is that um, a school can run a report and they can get what uh, is called their identified student percentage or ISP and what that represents is the proportion of students who are categorically eligible meaning are uh, category eligible for free meals, which means that they qualify for free meals because of their participation in other programs such as TANF, SNAP, and very recently Medicaid. So essentially it's, an, it's a method to try to identify high needs students and high needs schools. So you would take that identified student percentage and multiply it by 1.6. That 1.6 number um, is called the, the multiplier and it is set by the USDA and it, so it doesn't change. It just um, right for now is a static number 1.6. And the result is that ISP 
times multiplier gives you the proportion of students or of meals that will be reimbursed at that free rate. So in this example, with an ISP of 25 uh, times 1.6, 40% of all meals served at that school could be reimbursed at that free rate of 443, while the remaining 60% would be reimbursed at 43 cents. So this funding mechanism is great in the sense that it removes um, application burden, um, it helps reduce stigma since all students eat for free. However, the challenge with CEP is that in order for this mechanism to be financially viable, um, most schools need to have an ISP of 60% or higher. Otherwise, um, this mechanism may not be able to cover the total cost of meals served. If we can move on to the next slide. So those two systems that I just described, uh, the three-tiered system or the free and reduced price system and the community eligibility provision were the primary methods of funding school meals prior to the pandemic. And then, you know, COVID-19 hit. Um, and the USDA provided flexibilities to allow schools to serve uh, more meals to students when school was not in session. And one of those flexibilities was the ability to serve meals to all students, regardless of income, without applications. So this is our universal free meals program, um, or school meals for all, it can be called as well. And so during this period, all meals were reimbursed at the free rate um, using USDA funds. And it was a time where we saw uh, for the first time, you know, a national universal feeding program in our country. Um, and during this time there were, you know, there was no school meal debt. <laughs> there was no lunch shaming. There was a dramatic reduction in paperwork. And of course, importantly, increased participation in school meals. And then um, these waivers came to an end in 2022. And now we're at a point where, um, we've reverted back to either the three-tiered system or CEP, um, with the exception, as Ryan mentioned, as those eight states who have implemented their own state-level policies. So I do want to point out that in those eight states, it's not that the state took over 100% of funding for school meals. Instead, what they've done is they've encouraged schools to maximize their federal reimbursement, and then the state kind of covers um, the remainder. So, for example, in California, um, one of the parts of their legislation is that schools that are eligible should participate in CEP so that they can maximize federal reimbursement and then um, the state would help cover the rest to ensure that the, those schools remain financially viable. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. So there are lots of benefits of school meals. For all. Uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge that these benefits extend beyond just the students in the school meals and reach um, to families, uh, teachers, uh, school communities, um, and of course lunchroom staff. Um, so there's a reduction in stigma, stress, and paperwork burden, improved test scores, improved sense of community in schools, and of course the removal of school meal debt. Um, and with this, and, and a key benefit of course is also increased participation in school meals. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that increased meal participation and the subsequent reduction in paperwork burden, this really um, opens up schools, school food authorities, to be able to spend more of their time and resources on improving school meal quality. And there's a variety of ways that they can do that. Um, they have an improved opportunity to um, have staff training, to move towards more um, scratch prepped meals and a better ability to focus on values-based procurement, which of course is a strong focus of the National Farm to School Network. So really, while I think we've sort of always known that there was a lot of value in school meals for students in terms of reducing um, food insecurity, I think the pandemic has really brought to the forefront the role that school meals play in our broader food system. Um, and it's really highlighted the additional downstream impacts that school meals can have on diet quality, on economies, and on the environment. Um, so school meals represent one of the largest food expenditures with public dollars in the US. So they can be used as a very powerful tool to support local economies and local communities in addition to supporting our students. Um, so 
with I'll, I'll stop there because I think Ryan's going to continue on with discussing this connection. And I just want to highlight that increasing our access to school meals through school meals for all type programs is really a, a strong connector to these uh, values based procurement goals that we have with school food. Thanks so much, Sarah, um, for for this and and for for really opening up um, these policies and their interaction with um, uh, school food funding. Um, bringing this back to to farm to school, you know, in the farm to school journey and connecting school meals for all with values, you know, we really see schools as the best place to spark thinking about how we all live together in communities and farm to school meals and accompanying activities provide opportunities to understand how the food on our plates affects us. So from the well-being that good nutrition gives our kids to the broader worlds of local economies, chronic disease prevention, climate impacts, and more. And even better, when our kids learn about the hardworking farmers, fishers, and ranchers that feed us, schools become places that help us connect as parents, students, teachers, and neighbors to the land and to each other. So we really want to convey like a, a key message that connecting school meals for all local foods and values-based purchasing creates a just and resilient food system. Because it's one thing to have um, policies that provide free school meals, but they can do even more when they're designed with a focus on equity for an economic impact on uh, each person who has a hand in getting that food onto a child's plate. So we have to think about everyone along the farm to school journey. And, and to go beyond and to promote a fair food system, we must ensure that local food served to all students is produced uh, in a way that is values aligned. And we're seeing uh, this values alignment take shape in many of the states now with a permanent school meals for all policy. So many states that have permanently funded school meals for all also have policies to support farm to school. And many of these states also have local food purchasing incentive programs. And in many states, policies also include um, or aligned with um, food supports such as scratch cooking, um, reducing uh, meal waste, and providing culturally competent meals. Um, so really values aligned universal meals really adds up to be more than the sum of its parts. And it, it unlocks a school cafeteria's ability to contribute meaningfully to school and community food system transformation over time. So, you know, Sarah uh, mentioned, you know, like a lot of the immediate benefits of like ending school lunch stigma, you know, there's an increase in school meals that are eaten each day. There's no more unplanned school meal debt. And that can lead to increased revenue for, um, for investment in school kitchens, stable revenue, um, staff time that's unlocked to connect with local farmers and businesses that aligned with um, community values, which, you know, would in turn lead to these really great long-term benefits of flourishing local economies, robust farm to school programming, nourish children ready to learn, an empowered, trained, and well-paid cafeteria staff, and more. Um, this is a wonderful um, quote from uh, Kat Sultamurad, the food service director and uh, food service director in California, on how Universal Meals has impacted their um, program. And she says, Universal Meals takes away the stigma for students to access school meals. Um, the meals we provide are often the only ones struggling families have access to, especially for our unhoused students. Um, we are in a wealthy tourist area where many who live and work full time in our area can barely afford the cost of living. And our district went from serving 300,000 to 600,000 meals in just one year after Universal Meals was established. And this increase in participation has allowed me to rely less on USDA commodities and increase local purchasing by 50%. I'm buying regenerative beef, chicken, and mostly organic produce for our school sites, all thanks to Universal School Meals. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, states that have currently passed school meals for all also have policies supporting um, local food purchasing incentives. And LFPIs, as we call them, uh, kind of in-house, are programs that uh, provide additional funding to, to child nutrition program operators to directly offset or incentivize local food purchases. So LFPIs can provide more equitable financial support for child nutrition programs that may face challenges or that may face challenges in affording local ingredients. Um, LFPIs also boost the local agricultural economy by creating a positive cycle that increases institutional demand for local food 
which increases the vibrancy and uh, viability of local food market channels. And it, and it also increases the volume and variety of fresh nourishing local ingredients available to children, which in turn, um, you know, helps to create um, healthy meals. So if you wanna learn more about LFPIs, um, definitely check out our new webpage. And I'd like to highlight how Michigan, um, Michigan's initiative, 10 cents a meal, works together with their school meals for all policy. And this graphic offers a striking visual of how different scenarios impact meal content costs in local economies. So um, each plate uh, showcases where the ingredients were sourced, which sheds a light on the vital role of local food purchasing incentive programs and directing school food budgets towards local economies. And by including dollar amounts, sharing the cost to students and the income to local farmers per school meal, this, this graphic powerfully underscores the symbiotic uh, relationship between school meals programs and local purchasing incentives. And now while both school meals for all and local purchasing incentive policies have their distinct benefits, um, we see that in Michigan, um, school meals for all and their LFPI policies result in the greatest state investments in the community to benefit children and farmers. And as part of our campaign, um, we've put the spotlight on four different states that have successfully implemented universal meals. And in each report, we provide a detailed bill overview, top tips that help coalitions succeed, as well as practical wins and challenges that advocates experience during that implementation. And we're able to ob observe um, that each state has diverse universal meal policy features. So in establishing the program in California, they, they went the route of an educational omnibus budget trailer bill. In Colorado, they brought it before public ballot through Proposition FF, FF and in Maine and Vermont, they introduced theirs via typical legislation. Um, and of note, in Vermont, they introduced it via bipartisan committee. Um, we also see a range of complementary values aligned components to some of these school meals for all policies. In California, we see in their in their in their budget, they they included um, funds for kitchen infrastructure, food service staff training. Um, farm to school incubator grants, um, funding for evaluation. Um, in Colorado, there's a lot of similar things as well as um, including uh, a policy for uh, 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 parental um, and student uh, uh, task force to help shape their school meals policies. Um, Maine went the route of kind of keeping their, their bill very clean, um, but they do have a local food purchasing incentive um, policy that complements. And in Vermont, they were originally trying to pair theirs with, a, with, a, with an incentive, but decided to pass um, the school meals for all policy one year after the incentive passed. And speaking of Vermont, um, the Vermont Farm to School Network and Hunger Free Vermont developed um, the virtuous cycle of farm to school and school meals for all. And this virtuous cycle really shows how investments in universal school meals and a fully funded farm to school grants program and a local food purchasing incentive program can create a cycle that continuously elevates uh, school meals. And by so by increasing participation in school meals, the program generates more revenue for schools, which in turn allows for more local purchasing which elevates the quality of the meals overall. And this improved quality along with farm to school programming further increases participation and interest in school meals, thus creating the virtuous cycle. And as a result, um, we see improved student outcomes, a strength in local economy and the elimination of stigma from eating school meals. And Scott Fay, Child Nutrition Director says in Vermont, it's been brilliant how healthy school meals for all in the local food purchasing incentive came together to support creative purchasing. Prior to this, my district was spending three to 4% on local food, but now 17% is local just in the second year. And this is working as the incentive gave an avenue to experiment and build relationships with new and local producers. Um, at National Farm to School Network and with our partners uh, and state policy advocates, we're advancing different state level policies that are a win for kids, farmers, and communities. And um, this is a really great interactive state policy map um, for, for you to check out um, what's happening in your state and or territory during the current legislative session. And also in mid-February, we're going to be publishing a database of all school meal access bills, which will be a great resource for legislators. And if you'd like access to that before February, just feel free to reach out to us. And through our campaign, we have a whole range of other resources. Um, I've already mentioned the case studies. We have a range of webinars. We have our action packs for 
folks, as well as an interactive game to learn more about values alignment and school meals, as well as like a whole range of resources and briefs. So feel free to check this out following the uh, the webinar. And I would be remiss if I didn't shout out some of our partners resources. FRAC, the Food Research and Action Center has a um, several great resources and two that I want to highlight here is uh, a one is a state healthy school meals for all legislative chart and the other is an annotated bibliography um, highlighting the benefits of healthy school meals for all students. So with that, I just want to thank everyone again for taking some time uh, to to learn more about Values Line Universal Meals. Um, Again, if you want to reach out, my email is ryan at farmtoschool.org. You can also visit us on uh, farmtoschool.org and find all of our contact information. But I think at this time, I'm going to stop sharing and then bring Sarah back to the spotlight. And we're going to work on asking, answering some of the questions that you all have been putting in the chat. So. I'm also going to bring on uh, our our friend. Um, actually, never mind. Okay. Anyways, I'm going to open up the Q and A. Um, I've seen that we've already answered a couple questions, and that there's some that are open now. So Allison writes, uh, "My son's school recently received a pilot grant from Community Eligibility Provision that offers free breakfast and lunch to all students in the school, regardless of income." These meals so far have been um, cheese laden, processed, full of carbohydrates, not and not vegetarian friendly. Live near many local farms, a local agricultural university, and have many local year round farmer markets. Can we use these federal dollars to support the local community and provide local and fresher foods for our schools with this program? Sarah. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, funds are increased in participation, again, results in, um, sorry, participation in CEP generally means more per, uh, student participation and more money available um, to buy local foods. However, I do want to stress that right now with current reimbursement rates, schools often have uh, right about $1.25 to spend uh, per meal on food. So the remaining of that $4.34 has to be spent on things like um, equipment, staff salaries, um, and other goods and services that go into running a school food program. So while healthy school meals for all type um, legislation and increased access to school meals can increase funding by increasing participation, it's not an overnight situation. We do have to give schools time to now uh, to see, to realize those increases in participation and then be able to work with local farmers in order to, to make those um, purchases. I will add to, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but there are um, specific procurement policies that determine which vendors you can work with. Um, and so a school food department can't just go out and work with a farmer um, sort of right away. There has to be um, some very specific rules and things sort of put in place. And that's because ultimately they're spending taxpayer dollars. So there are procurement guidelines that have to be followed. And so those relationships um, take time to, to set up. Um, and you have to work with farmers and their um, their growth cycles. <laughs> so we can't usually walk up to a, to a farm, a local farm, and ask them to provide produce for the next week or the following week, right? Because they wouldn't have had those things in the ground yet, um, especially at a level that could support a school meal. Um, so steps to improve access to school meals through universal feeding programs definitely put schools in a position to do all of that work. Um, but it does take time um, to get all that stuff established and functioning. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. And then another uh, question from an anonymous attendee. How do we balance supporting local ag, scratch cooking, and feeding thousands of students today? I find that the reality of the situation is frustrating for school nutrition professionals because they don't feel they have adequate support to supply students with values-based meals when following federal guidelines, i.e. the meal pattern and the urgency of day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, so that's definitely a challenge. Um, my prior work in the school district, you know, we had uh, 30 school locations and 30,000 students. And so the idea of being able to work with a single farm, you know, to supply any part of our school meals um, 
was certainly challenging. So I definitely recognize and understand the the tight tight rope <laughs> that most school food professionals are trying to walk in serving meals. And you know, I don't know that we have a perfect answer for that, other than I would say that the communities around us are more and more interested in this work. And so we have places like the National Farm to School Network and their broad network of local partners who are in the game trying to help schools carry out this work. I know in Arizona, we have a really strong network of, of uh, farm to school network um, stakeholders who are working to try to support schools in the best that they can. Um, I'll continue to reiterate that I think if we take away the, the need to collect applications, process applications and collect money on the line, we're still, that's gonna open up a little bit more <laughs> time and resources so that there's one less thing uh, and that might help you know, provide more time to start these relationships. And then finally, I think that I'll add that we cannot expect school programs to go from their current operations to 100% organic scratch prep overnight. And these are gonna be slow incremental changes that grow with the support of the community around them again. Um, including all of our farm to school network folks. So I think if we look at it as sort of one product at a time, potentially one meal at a time and kind of make it its smaller bits, it can become more um, manageable for school food departments. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and we, another question is, hi, I'm curious if y'all have any numbers um, on if there was a significant increase in taxpayer dollars in states where there are universal school meals. Like, is it a drastic difference or relatively small when you look at overhead costs? And I'll just share, you know, in Wisconsin, they kind of did a, a kind of like, uh, kind of like a, a common sense, kind of easy digest breakdown. I think it the, the tax burden increase is roughly like 50 to $60 per taxpayer or per person, which basically equates to like a dollar a week for, for free school meals for all, which is um, an incredible return on investment. Um, so yeah, I think that there's, there's, there's some others that have might've done some little, little, you know, some of this kind of breakdown, but that's the one that kind of tops comes top to mind. Sarah, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah, I think in a lot of states, it's actually um, almost too soon to really tell because most states are still in their first or maybe second year of these. Um, so we'll be getting more concrete, I think, numbers on that as we go forward. But, you know, to Ryan's point, um, there are carry on costs for the foods, right, that are, are purchased in a school food program. And so those dollars um, are being spent by the state, but they're going back into the state as well. Um, and so they can help generate um, more um, economic activity in the state. Awesome. And um, can I share a little bit yeah, go more ahead. on that? I was just doing these like back of the envelope calculations yesterday. Hi, Cassandra Bull, Policy Specialist, National Farm to School Network. So inspired by the Wisconsin example, um, I have it only for four states thus far on the taxpayer spend week by week proxy figure. Um, so that's uh, residents over 18. For California, even with the increased budget, it's 49 cents a week. Maine is 57. Vermont is, uh, these are cents, is 94 cents. And Minnesota is 95 cents. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Cassandra. All right, I think we have time for one more quick question. So do school food authorities have planning documents the way a municipality might produce a transportation planning document? How often are these planning documents updated? Are they mandated by USDA? What's the process to produce school food planning documents? So I don't think so, <laughs> at least not in the way that might be uh, set up for uh, a municipality. Um, so each school district um, would you know, sort of be responsible for all of their transportation and shipping, but that's going to look just very, very different from school to school. Um, there's a lot of things mandated by the USDA in order to operate a school meal system, but I don't think uh, transportation planning is, is necessarily one of those. There's a lot of rules about how produce can be delivered to schools, um, and that often falls on the vendors that are providing that uh, produce and goes into how we select vendors and what vendors are eligible to serve schools and that sort of thing. Um, 
I'm not 100% sure if I'm, I'm getting at the root of that question, but hopefully that's some information. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. Well, we are almost at time, so I'm going to go ahead and start bringing us home. Um, thank you all again for taking the time. Thank you so much, Sarah Martinelli. Um, I just want to quickly plug that next month, October, is Farm to School Month, National Farm to School Month, and many states also do a lot around celebrating that. So if you want to learn more about how to celebrate with this, head on over to farmtoschool.org. Um, we invite everyone who, here who's attending who might not already be a partner to consider joining us as a partner organization or as an individual member. Um, you know, we we are just excited to be able to grow this movement um, with with you all. Um, but with that, thank you again. Thank you, Sarah, um, and everyone on the NFS te and team who helped to support. So um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.